be seated and we'll have the children come up front for children's time. Want to sit down around here for me? I am telling you right now, I am so excited because I get to tell something about Jesus and who Jesus is to me. When they asked me to do this little story for you guys on Children's Sunday, I get so excited because he's everything to me. And I find him in everything that I look at, I use. I try to find a little story that Jesus has a message for me, and you can do the same thing, and I'm going to kind of teach you how to do that today. Now, today, Pastor Barry is going to preach on a parable. Does anybody know what a parable is? It's a little story, and the Bible says it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's really, truly just a message that we can understand. The Bible sometimes is kind of hard to understand. Have you found that out? I have. I found it out. It's kind of hard to understand. So Jesus said, I want everybody to understand what I really mean and get to know who I really am. So he told it in parables. So today I brought three items that we use every day, and I'm going to see if and see if you can see that I see a message from Jesus to me in these three things. And when I do that, I want you to come home because I brought you something to take home with you after church. And there's a message in there from Jesus to you. And I want you to see if you can figure out what that message is. And next Sunday, I want you to look me down, hunt me down, and tell me what that message is, because I get so excited. I love it. I am so excited about telling who Jesus is. Hashtag, who's this man called Jesus? This is who this man is to me. Okay, the first thing I brought, we've got to remember the Bible tells us there's real treasures in the Bible. If we just search and search, we can find treasures, and they are so exciting to find. Do you like to see a treasure? I love to go out and find treasures. Well, I like to find treasures in Jesus' word, and I, this is what I found today. Here's my little treasure box that I bought, see? And I brought some stuff in here that's kind of treasures. So the first thing I brought, who can tell me what this is? A calculator, right. What does a calculator do? Right, solves your problems, doesn't it? So if we put in 2 plus 2 is what? But what if we put 2? Oh, no, you don't want to cheat. Oh, Uh uh-oh. We need to go to the altar afterwards, honey, right here. (laughs) Okay. Now, let's say we put in 2 million times, 4 million times, 3 million. I would not have any idea what that, the answer to that is. Would you? But how does this thing know? Have you ever wondered how this little tiny thing here, with all kind of numbers, knows the answer to this problem that you just put in? I don't know. But I have faith when I push that number in that 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 answer is going to come up and it's going to be right. How do I know? Because it's happened to me. It happens to me. This, this is a thing that when I want to add something, and I'm telling you, I cannot add. I took some money to the bank for the food pantry the other day. I had added it five times, and I still had it wrong. So it's, I really need something like this to solve my problems. But then I got thinking. When I have a problem in the world, who do I go to? I First, I try to solve it myself. Then if I can't solve it, I'll call a friend. And one day, this is a real good example of how God cares about our problems. I was decorating the church um, communion table. It was the night before Easter. And you know, at Easter, you want everything to look real good because that's the day that Jesus, that Jesus arose from the grave and gave us new life. All of a sudden, I was working on this flower, and that flower would bend this way, it would bend that way. I mean, for two hours, I worked on that flower, and I, out of sheer frustration, I didn't ask because I really wanted to know. I just said, Lord, you've got to help me with this. And I heard him say, pick that up and just turn it around. I picked it up, and it was the most beautiful flower I've ever seen. And I could almost vision Jesus just standing there thinking, oh, she'll get tired of doing her own way. And she'll ask me, and when she does, here I am waiting on her. 
He answers every one of my problems. And you know what I found out about the problems? The bigger the problem, the greater the blessing. You think the things are so, so bad. But once you give it to him and you let him solve that problem, it's the best blessing you ever had. Now, this, who knows what this is? A phone. Who does not have a cell phone? Do you have a cell phone? No, I don't. You don't? Do you know what they are? Yes, my mom uses them all the time. There you go. <laughs> Most of us use them all the time. Be real honest with you, I never bring mine into church because I'm always scared it's going to go off and I would be embarrassed. So I don't bring it in, but I just did it. I just kind of gave myself a little leadway today since I'm going to do the message here. So this phone, have you ever wondered how a phone that's connected to nothing, nothing at all, can you can call anybody in the whole world and you ring that number and you have someone on the other end or a recording. You know that's going to happen. And you put that number in, you have faith that somebody's going to answer that call. Well, guess what? This reminded me that every time I call on Jesus, he's there for me. He never puts me on hold. His line's never, ever busy. He never doesn't call me back. And I don't ever hear, uh, after the beep, leave a message, I'll get back with you. Jesus doesn't do that. And guess what? He never sends me a bill at the end of the month. He always answers my call. Now, the next thing I brought in my little treasure chest is, what's this? A CD. A CD. Have you ever wondered how this little CD that you can put in a machine and it gives you the most beautiful, soothing music you ever heard? Your heart just kind of gets peaceful. It takes kind of the worries of the cares of the world away. How does that really happen? I don't know. I have no idea. But I know it does. Because I know when I put this disc into that player, I'm going to get the music that's going to soothe my soul. How does it happen? Because I know it happens to me all the time. No more than I know that when the whole world's falling down around me and it looks so crazy and I think I can't take it anymore, Jesus puts a song in my heart. Amen. He puts the peace that passes all understanding right here in my heart that's something that the world cannot take away. Jesus is the man in our life that who is hashtag Jesus? He's the one that answers every one of our calls. He's the one that hears every need we have, solves every one of our problems, and puts a song in our heart when the rest of the world is going crazy. So today when Pastor Barry's up there preaching, he's going to preach about the parable of the sower and the seed. And I don't, I'm not going to give you your gifts that I made you. I made you, each one of you, like I said, a little keychain. I made these myself, so if they fall apart, it's my fault. So you get, everybody gets one, but you got to see me after church to get it because I don't want anything to distract you from what pastor's going to say because I want you, now that you know what a parable is, I want you to listen to him and tell us at the end of the day or your, your parents when you're home with them at lunch, who is the sower and what is the seed? That's the parable. So today the question is, who is Jesus to you? Will you bow your head so I can say a prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I just come today and I thank you for this wonderful day. And I thank you, Lord, for just allowing me to be a part of who you want me to be. And I ask you, Lord, to be with the pastor today as he preaches. And help us, each one of us, to know that we are the sowers of what's your word. And we ask you, Lord, to guide and direct the pastor's words. We ask you, Lord, if there's one person in here that does not know you, that you touch their heart. You open up your word to them that they understand that truly you are the Son of God. We ask it all in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, remember, right after church, I expect to see every one of you back at that door. Okay? To get this surprise. Thank you. Good morning, church. And let me say thank you, Mel, for that. Thank you very much. Uh, part of my message may have just been given by Mel. 
So if I repeat, it's, all, it's already here, but we're just reinforcing that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mel. Well, uh, before we dig into the scripture this morning and continue in our message series, hashtag Jesus, what would, uh, who do we say Jesus is and, and what does it mean to follow him today? Um, I, I need to just very quickly give you two public service announcements. First of all, um, and it's, it's, in, it's um, appropriate, I think, that we just had our kids up here at our altar area because we have been talking about the fact that as a church, we are trying to move into um, a new era in children's ministry in terms of expanding and building upon the children's ministry that we have and really um, really just trying to reach more children, reach children with families, and really make a difference in children's lives through Jesus Christ, even more than we already are. And, I, and we already are, I know. Uh, so to that end, we are looking to uh, recruit staff to do that. Uh, but in recruiting staff, we need a vision. We need a vision for what our congregation sees as important in children's ministry. This past Wednesday night, uh, we had a gathering, and I appreciate so much those that came and shared. It was a good time, um, and I appreciate what I learned, and I appreciate what we learned together, and we're going to take that seriously, okay, as we go forward into what our children's ministry should look like. I understand, though, that, you know, with school back in session, midweek is not always the greatest time for folks to come, so we're going to have one more opportunity for you to give your insight into what our children's ministry should look like. So next Sunday morning, immediately after worship service, uh, I'd like to meet with parents of elementary school age children or even children preschool age. Those parents, as well as any teachers or anyone who has an educational background or a background in the educational system, we'll meet right down here on these first couple of rows and we'll have one more opportunity for you to share your insight and your thoughts as, as God gives you insight uh, in wisdom. Share that with us, and we'll be building on that. So, just to let you know, it's, a, it's, it's coming up quickly, but our, our uh, staffing up and moving forward is coming up quickly as well. So, next Sunday, September 8th, after morning worship, just stay here for just a few minutes, if you will, and we'll talk a little bit more and gather insights about children's ministry. So, uh, that's why I wanted to share that right now, because I knew the children's uh, ministry was coming up here at the altar and I thought maybe it, was, it would serve as a good reminder to us. One more thing to share with you. Now, this is a point of personal privilege. Um, I want to just take a moment and invite you to share with me in expressing your appreciation to someone. Um, I want to express a word of appreciation to John Bonham. He doesn't know this, but John and Deborah are going on a vacation. And if anybody in the world ever deserved a vacation, it's John Bonham. Uh, I understand that when a church goes through a transition in pastoral leadership, there's, there's always a lot to be done. And uh, sometimes that, that well, the, just the elements of that transition tend to fall on, on key people in the church. And it fell heavily on John. John has worked extra hours, far more hours than he's ever supposed to do. Uh, this past year, and frankly, I have never come to a church and had someone that faithful to me the first two months I've been here, just letting me know what going on, giving me the background and letting me know how things are, and just being right there with me. It's been an extreme blessing, and I would be remiss before he leaves if I didn't say thank you from me. I'd like you to have an opportunity to say thank you to John as well. And John, you now have an awful lot of thanking to do to Deborah because of Deborah's patience and support, and we appreciate that as well. All right. Well, having said that, let's continue in our message series. We are looking at Jesus. Who do we say that he is? 
and how do we follow him in today's world? And we're looking at the first eight chapters of the Gospel of Mark. Why? Because the Gospel of Mark is a get right to the point gospel. Mark writes his gospel as we've seen in earlier messages. Um, he writes to a contemporary world that's not so different than our contemporary world. In the days of the Roman Empire and the first generation Christians, the Romans were, were the type of people that wanted you to get straight to the point. And Mark is a straight to the point writer. And so we're looking at the first eight chapters because the first eight chapters deal with who is Jesus and what does it mean to follow him. The last eight chapters take us on Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. And the last eight chapters help us understand what it means for Jesus to be Savior of the world and what that's going to take him to, ultimately to crucifixion and resurrection. And we'll cover that again in the future, but for now in this message series, we're looking at the first eight chapters. And we've seen already different aspects of Jesus and his life and ministry and how that was impacting the folks around him and what application we can make for us today as his followers. Today, we're in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 34. Again, this is a lengthy scripture because I want to go verse by verse. I don't want to leave a single thing out of Mark's gospel because if Mark wrote it, it was important, he felt, that he needed to write it under the inspiration of God's Spirit. So I want to go word for word. These are long passages of Scripture, and as I've said before, usually we would stand for the acknowledgement of God's Word, but since they're so long, I'm going to allow you during this series to remain seated, but I do want you to give holy attention and attentiveness to the Word of God as we share it together. If you have your Bibles, you can read along. If it's on your Bible app, you can read along, or you can read along on the screen behind me as we share together in God's Word. Hear now the Word of the Lord. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, anyone, he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And while they have no root in themselves but endure for a while, then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For the one who has, more will be given, and from one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. 
And he said the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord God, in these moments, speak to us through the power of your spirit and the authority of your word, that we may hear what you would say to us and be empowered by your grace in faith to go forth and do what you call us to do. For this we pray in the name of the word made flesh, Christ our Lord. Amen. Last week... I showed you a couple of pictures of what people think Jesus could look like. One picture uh, was a very traditional picture that probably comes to mind when we think of Jesus. The other one was one that forensic scientists put together based on what a Galilean Jew of the first century might look like. And we realized that Jesus' appearance might be somewhat different than, than oftentimes what we have in mind. Well, what about where Jesus ministered? Well, Jesus' base of ministry in Galilee was not his hometown, not Nazareth, because the Gospel of Luke tells us that, well, the folks of Nazareth thought he was, you know, sort of gotten above his raisin. He had, he had become this celebrity preacher in their eyes, and, and, and they found themselves resentful of what he was doing and what he was accomplishing and wanting to remember him as just another of their residents. Who did he think he was? So Nazareth was not his base of operations. His base of operations became the city of Capernaum, oftentimes called Capernaum. And it's in this location that he based most of his ministry. Wasn't there all the time. He journeyed everywhere. But more often than not, when he went back to rest and back to touch base again with to spend some time with his disciples, it was in and around Capernaum. And Capernaum was on the Sea of Galilee. So this picture shows you the view of the Sea of Galilee from just down the hill from Capernaum. What you're seeing is Jesus' sanctuary. This is where Jesus preached. The crowds followed him, and he would lead them down by the sea, and he would have disciple, his disciples get a boat for him, and then push the boat out into the water, and from the boat he would preach to the crowds gathered by the shore. So when you think about Jesus in a sanctuary preaching, it's not a sanctuary like this, and he's not using a pulpit like this. That's his sanctuary, and his pulpit is a boat. Because the emphasis is on the people. And what was the content of his preaching when he was preaching out there on the water, on the boat, facing the people, the crowds gathered on the shore? What was the content of his preaching? Well, a couple of weeks ago, when I was uh, early in my ministry here, just starting with you as, as your pastor, I preached on the kingdom of God. And I told you at that time that I, pre I wanted to preach about the kingdom of God because that's exactly what Jesus preached about. According to the Gospels, he spent more time talking about the kingdom of God than any other theme. Now, there were many subjects Jesus addressed. And he addressed certain subjects over and over again, some of them surprising. But always under the overall theme of the kingdom of God. And so I thought it was important a couple of weeks ago to preach on the kingdom of God and I shared with you a quotation from Jeff Christopherson who is a noted scholar in terms of mission and missional ministry uh, and and 
not only doing missions around the world, but even missions at home and in church planting. And Jeff Christopherson, in his book Kingdom First, defined the kingdom of God in this way. He said, the kingdom of God is what the world looks like when King Jesus has his way. The kingdom of God is, is what the world looks like when King Jesus is in control, when he is reigning in the hearts and the minds and the lives of people. That's the kingdom of God. And Jesus, in teaching about the kingdom of God, often turned to using parables. And what are parables? Mel, you did that perfectly. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's exactly what it is. And in our scripture this morning, Jesus uses a variety of parables, of stories, to try to help us understand the nature of the kingdom of God. He says something in the passage that sometimes can be confusing. He, he quotes the Old Testament. He quotes from the, the pages of the Hebrew scriptures to say that Parables are often used so that some people catch on and other people don't. And when we read that, sometimes we think, well, you mean there were some people that Jesus didn't want to understand his message? He was used parables so that some would understand and some wouldn't? Well, no, if you read carefully what Jesus is saying when he quotes this passage, he's not saying that it's his determination. It's just reality. It's reality. There are going to be those folks who are so hungry and so thirsty for the kingdom of God that they'll pay close attention and they'll get what he's saying. And for those that's only interested in criticizing or condemning or making fun or putting him in his place, the parables aren't going to make any sense. They're not going to help them out. That's what he's getting at. The parables are for those who are hungering and thirsting for the kingdom of God. And even for us today, for his parables to make sense, we have to be hungering and thirsting for the kingdom of God. We must hunger and thirst for God's reign and rule in our lives, in our families, in our neighborhoods and communities, in our church and our world. And as we hunger and thirst for the kingdom of God, we begin to understand what the kingdom of God is all about. So in, in these verses this morning, Jesus shares some truths about the kingdom of God. And if you have your outline in the bulletin this morning, you can follow along and, and take some notes. Let's just look at some of these truths very quickly. First of all, first of all, we learn that we are called to sow God's seed in confidence and with, with patient faith. The Scripture this morning includes the parable of the sower. And when I was in seminary, my uh, English Bible instructor, basically Bible study instructor, reminded us that we've come to call this the parable of the sower, but it's actually the parable of the soils. Because it's really about the condition of people's hearts. The soils represent people's hearts and why there are some people who are receptive to the message of the kingdom of God and why there are others that are not as receptive. So in the, the course of this parable of the sower, we find it starts out simply this way. A farmer went out to sow his seed. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Now, I'm from West Virginia, and if you're going to farm in West Virginia, you have got to have confidence and patient faith, okay? Because, you know, West Virginia, the, the, the name of the state, the motto of the state, the nickname of the state is the Mountain State, and it's true. You know, the old joke is, you know, if you're from West Virginia, you know, you may have been born with two legs that were equal in length, but at the end of your life, one's always shorter than the other because of the way the mountains are. And believe you me, I have seen the way people plant gardens in West Virginia, and it's, it's a wonder they get any crops at all because of the difficulty of the terrain. And I imagine, and here in Indiana, it looks like it's a piece of cake for, for a boy from West Virginia. You know, it's nice and flat here in Indiana. 
And I mean to tell you, I have never seen the sheer amount of corn and beans that I've seen in my life. If someone gives me, my wife and I were talking about that, and I said, you know, what's the, you know, we were talking about the biggest change coming to Indiana. I said, you can't drive by landmarks, because everywhere there's corn and beans. You can't tell them apart. What are you going to do, turn into the next cornfield? The next bean patch can't do that. It's everywhere, and you can see it everywhere, and it's wonderful. Crops are wonderful. It's wonderful to see seed take root and grow and produce a crop. A farmer has to have confidence and has to sow seed with patient faith. Jesus begins his parable assuming that. And let's, let's talk about reality. It kind of touches on what Mel said earlier. Ultimately, the great sower is Jesus. Ultimately, Jesus is the sower because he's the one bringing us the truth of God's word. He is the fulfillment of God's word in the Old Testament. And he is the expounder and explainer of it in the New Testament. So Jesus is the ultimate sower, but here's the thing. As followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, we're called to sow on his behalf. So when we look at this parable, yes, we're looking at theologically Jesus sowing seed, but practically as his followers, we're also thinking about it, what it means for us to sow seed. And what we're being reminded is that when we sow seed, and what is the seed? The seed is the Word of God. The seed is the Word of God. So as you and I spread the Word of God and share the Word of God as disciples of Jesus, we are to do so in confidence and with patient faith. In other words, you don't let anything keep you from sowing it, and you don't get discouraged in the process of sowing it. And I would say that jives with agriculture pretty well. Because when springtime comes, you plant. And yeah, there may be a lot of reasons not to, but you plant. Because it's time to plant. And in the summertime, you go about weeding and watching and waiting and trusting because that's what you do. And you don't let circumstances get you down you wait to see what the harvest will bring. And that truism is the same about witnessing for Christ. Because if we look in the scripture this morning, and we turn especially to verses 21 through 25, we hear Jesus say these words. This is how important it is for us to share the word of God wherever we are, in whatever circumstances in. He says, he said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out in the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. First thing I thought of when I read this, I thought of the very first song I ever remember learning in Sunday school. You know what it was? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? Oh, somebody's been to my Sunday school. Or we've shared the same material. No, I'm going to let it shine. You see, the thing of it is, sowing the word, sharing the good news of Jesus is not optional for followers of Jesus. It is essential. It is at the very heart of who we are. And in fact, it's evidence that God's Holy Spirit is at work in us. I've got friends of mine who come from a little different theological tradition, a little different uh, worship persuasion, and they really emphasize the gifts of the Spirit. And there's something to be said for that, and we'll talk about that more in an upcoming sermon series, just to let you know. But here's the thing. The gifts of the Spirit are given to people in order to be useful and yield the fruit of the Spirit. You don't measure where you are in Jesus by the gifts he's given you. You measure where you are in Jesus by the fruit you're producing. And some of our brothers and sisters in faith get a little confused about that because they, they think, well, the gifts, I mean, the more gifts I have, the more spiritual I must be. No, 
The New Testament always comes back and says, if you want to be like Jesus, yield fruit. Yield fruit. And so, really, the defining mark of a mature Christian is someone who constantly and consistently, when given the opportunity and with grace, shares the good news of Jesus. That's the mark of a mature Christian. That's the mark of a spirit-filled Christian. Sowing the seed, sharing the word of God, declaring the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus goes on and, and says, Consider carefully what you hear in verse 24. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even that will be taken from them. That might sound a bit confusing, but think about this. When the people in Jesus' day went to the marketplace, and they needed to buy grain, okay? You knew you needed a certain amount of grain, so you brought your measuring cup, which, of course, in Bible days was considerably larger than the measuring cups we keep in kitchens today. But you bring the measuring cup, and it's important to bring the right measuring cup because if you need a certain amount of grain, and the measuring cup is how they measured how much they needed in Bible times, if you accidentally brought a measuring cup that was a little smaller, the person in the marketplace was going to take advantage of you. They're going to say, how much you need? Oh, I need, you know, I need this much grain. And that person's going to think, hmm, that person brought a measuring cup not quite that, not quite big enough for that. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll give them, I'll fill their cup, but I'll charge them for what they say they want. In other words, they come to the marketplace, they bring a measuring cup too small, and they don't quite get everything they bought they don't get their money's worth jesus says as followers of the kingdom of god as his followers we need to make sure we bring the right measuring cup because oftentimes we ask too little of god in our witnessing we say god give me just this much faith and this much ability and this much opportunity to share my faith and if we ask for just that much, that's about how much we'll get. But if we ask for this much faith and grace and opportunities to share Jesus Christ, God will give it to us. You see, the problem too often times in evangelism in today's world is not, is not the fact that people aren't listening. It's that we aren't sharing. Or that we're sharing too little. The danger to the church today is that our dreams for God have become too small. I hear a lot about churches who dream about big budgets and big buildings and big everything. And, and I understand that. I understand that all of that can be used for the kingdom of God. I'm not casting judgment. But I'll tell you what churches need to dream about now. Churches need to dream about reaching whole communities for Jesus Christ. If you've seen the way that the devil can reach communities through opioids and addictions and alcohol and drugs and insidious understandings of what it means to, to be a person in today's culture, if you see that power at work, why in the world can the church of Jesus Christ not tap into the Holy Spirit and be the antidote to that? Because sometimes we're not bringing a big enough cup to the marketplace. We need to bring a bigger cup and be filled. And according to the scripture, according to that measure, we can be given even more. And be effective for the kingdom of God. Folks, we are the church of Jesus Christ. We don't have to sit back and look at our community and look at our county and say, can you believe what's happening? We need to sit back and look at our county and community and say, can you believe what God can do if we will yield to him? That makes the difference. Point number two. The seed's success does not depend on us. The seed's success does not depend on us. Look in verses 26 through 29. Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the great grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. 
Jesus is saying, our task as his followers is to sow the seed and then trust him for the result. If we will sow in faith, we can trust God with the result and with the harvest. The success doesn't depend on us. So many times, I think, when we share our faith in Christ, we want to share it with someone that we think is going to be receptive and respond positively. We tend to shy away from the people that we think won't receive it because we think they're never going to listen, they're going to give me a hard time, they're going to get into an argument, I don't want to deal with it. So we kind of pick and choose where we share the seed based on if we think we're going to have a positive outcome. Now, don't get me wrong. Yes, Jesus talked about sharing the gospel in his day and age and telling his disciples that you go preach in a community and if no one's going to listen to you, you shake the dust off your feet and go to another one. Well, that's about, okay, being in ministry and doing something. If that doesn't work, then you do something else. You be sensitive to where God's leading and don't get caught up in habits or routines and rituals. That's fine. But sharing the word of God, we're to do that everywhere with everyone in whatever opportunity God gives us. We can't be afraid of a negative response. Because it's not about the result, it's about being faithful. And when we are faithful in sharing our faith and in spreading the seed of God's word, we can trust God with the rest. And that relieves us of a great burden as followers of Christ. We don't have to determine the success. We just have to be faithful in the planting. And that leads us then to point number three. Point number three and four both have to do with the specific parable of the sower or the parable of the soils. Okay, And here are the two things we take away from that parable. First of all, discipleship is necessary if we are to produce fruit for the kingdom. Discipleship is necessary if we are to produce fruit for the kingdom. In the parable of the sower, or the parable of the soils, the parable sows the seed, and the the first seed falls on the path, which is hard ground. Hard ground. And if you know a pathway, you know that's what it is. When I was growing up back in West Virginia, um, my grandfather had a dairy farm, and even my dad and my uncles still raised cattle seasonally. And so there were always cows running across the farm, and his kids... We wanted to go to one place to another on the farm. We would follow the pathways. The cows made paths, and the more they trod on those paths and and were attached to them, the harder the ground became. And the harder the ground became, it became impossible for vegetation to grow up because there was always somebody walking on the path. And Jesus said that if a sower sows seed on a pathway, it's hard ground. The seed won't take root. And if the seed doesn't take root, it's just lying there. The birds of the air will come and eat it. It never gets started in what it's supposed to do in terms of becoming fruit. Likewise, he says, when the sower throws seed on rocky ground, there may be enough soil there for the the seed to come in and, and start to sprout, but there's not enough soil there for roots to come in. And so when sunlight comes, Instead of being sunlight being the blessing of helping to cause the crop to, to generate and to rise and to yield its fruit, instead the sunlight actually scorches the plant because the plant doesn't have root. What do we learn from this? We learn from this that discipleship is necessary if we're to produce fruit for the kingdom. Discipleship. Okay. Sometimes this parable is about It's about us, and it's about the people we share the gospel with. It's actually about both. Because you and I are called to let the word of God take root in us. To let it take root in us. Because according to Jesus in this parable, if we don't allow the word of God to take root in us, then ultimately, without roots, When hard times, persecution come along, we can't withstand it. And it's too easy to go back on our faith. Now, again, there's some theological traditions that are not crazy about hearing this. 
But let's just be honest. When we invite a person into saving faith, when we invite a person into the kingdom of God, when we invite a person to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, we are inviting them to a relationship that is committed. We are not inviting them into 15 minutes of an emotional response and then a couple of magic words in a prayer. Now, I've quit preaching and gone to meddling. But I've seen this from my, my boyhood. I, the church I grew up in used to, used to have revivals every spring and fall. Any of you remember that? Used to have revivals every spring and fall. It never failed. The next, to, next, to night, next to last night of the revival was youth night. And evangelists would always know how to evoke emotional response from the youth in whatever way. And you'd see a bunch of youth come to the altar, and they'd come, and they would be emotional. And there'd be someone who'd say, well, you know, here's what you do. You accept Christ, say this prayer, and you'll be okay. And then nobody follows up. Nobody ever followed up with us. Guess what? Once the emotion wore off, and the words of the prayer didn't sink in, the next week, the lives of the youth weren't changed. They had had an emotional response and shared a couple of words and nothing took root. Now, I know I have my brothers and sisters and friends in the church who would say, well, that's soul winning and at least you did that. But here's the thing, folks. Here's the thing. And, and I share this with you because I am deeply rooted in the Wesleyan tradition, which is we believe that when you win someone to the, to the kingdom of God for Jesus Christ, it's not simply about getting somebody into heaven. It's about getting heaven into them. It is about having someone enter the kingdom of God in a committed relationship with Jesus Christ in the here and now so that today they begin living abundantly. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That is not a future tense in the Greek. It is present tense. We start to live abundantly in Jesus Christ and make a difference for Christ right now. And when death comes, it's but a doorway. We go from being a part of the kingdom of God in this world to a kingdom of God in heaven celebrating eternally. But our salvation starts in the here and now, and our fruitfulness and usefulness is in the here and now. We are not here to punch somebody's ticket for the future. We are here to change their lives in this world in the here and now. Not just simply to get people into heaven, and that is so important, but we are to get heaven into them. And Jesus is bringing that home in this parable. That's what we're called to do, and in order to do that, we ourselves need to have heaven in us as we sow the seed. And that brings us to point four. Worldliness will never let fruit for the kingdom ripen. Jesus talks about seed being sown in thorny ground. And the thorns and the weeds choke out any fruitfulness in the plant. Jesus identifies worldliness in two ways. Worries and wealth. Worries and wealth. And I will tell you that those continue to be the biggest impediments both to people who, who are growing in their faith as well as sharing our faith with others. We can share the good news of Jesus, but we have to share it in such a way that it helps people understand that God wants to relieve and alleviate their worries. And he has a way that, of, to offer us that is beyond simply wealth. Too many people in our world today believe that they've made it in life if they don't have as many worries as they used to have and they have more wealth than they used to have. The problem is, if you get into that situation, you become worldly and you become trusting in what the world provides for you and not what God has for you. We have to be otherworldly ourselves in the way we present the kingdom of God and the word of God and we have to present it in such a way that addresses people's worldliness in terms of their worries and wealth. And I know it's hard sometimes to share our faith with people who are so caught up in worries. Because they're like, well, if I accept Jesus today and start living for him today in a committed relationship, are all my worries going to go away? And the answer is no. 
but what those worries are doing to you will. And if I commit my life to Christ, am I going to be more financially well off? No. But you're going to discover that the things in life that can't be bought and sold are going to mean a whole lot more to you. So we have to understand when we sow the, the seed that we have to address worldliness. And be upfront with people about what Jesus has come to do. Point number five is simply this. The, kingdom to produce, the, the key to producing kingdom fruit is ongoing receptivity. Ongoing receptivity. What does that mean? That means that Barry Taylor, pastor, has to be open to growing in my faith and growing in the word of God every day. When I get to the point where I say, you know something, I'm mature enough. I am sanctified enough. I am justified, sanctified, filled with the Spirit, washed in the blood, checked my baggage for heaven. I'm ready to go. I'm not going to do anything else from now on. I'm too good for this world. When I reach that point to where I am no longer teachable, preachable, or usable, I'm bait for Satan. The key to producing kingdom of God is it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how long you've been in church, how long you've been a Christian, how many resources you have, how few resources you have. The key to being effective for the kingdom of God is to always be teachable, always be leadable, always be receptive and say, here am I, Lord, send me. And point number six is simply this. Jesus says in verses 30 to 32, kingdom fruit has boundless and eternal significance. I think all I have to do is probably just read that scripture again to get that across. I've shared before with you about the mustard seed, the smallest of the seeds that become such a huge tree in the Middle East. Jesus says, what shall we say about the kingdom of God? This is verse 30. Or what parable shall we use to describe? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. In other words, when the kingdom of God takes root, the results are always far more than we could imagine. In fact, it's like filling a cup with water, filling it so full that it just spills over. The mustard seed not only becomes a big tree, but it comes a tree that does more than just produce shade for the owner. It produces a home for birds of the air. And that's the nature of the kingdom of God. Always in abundance. And when you share Jesus Christ with just one person, it's like throwing a rock into a pond. Now, Indiana, I think, is a lot like West Virginia. Back in West Virginia, every farmer had to have a pond. You had to take the creek and you had to build a dam, and you had to have a pond. You had to have a pond, of course, to, for watering for the animals. And I can remember as a kid, nothing was more fun than to go out to my grandfather's pond or to my uncle's pond or wherever we were at and throw stones in the middle of the pond and watch how a little, little rock in the middle of the pond will start to make waves. And before long, those waves get bigger and bigger, and they lap on the shore. And we want to see how small of a rock we could throw to make a big wave on the shore. You want to make a big wave in this world? You want to make a difference in this world? Share your faith with one person. One person. And that's what I'm going to give you a chance to do right now. Now, this is a little different nature of an invitation. I understand that. Um, but here's what I'm going to invite you to do. Because I believe this is of the Lord and of the Scripture. We're meeting on Labor Day. Labor Day traditionally begins the season of harvest oftentimes pastors preach on the harvest in fact on labor day the harvest is plentiful the laborers are few jesus said and we talk about labor and and resting in the lord here's what i'm going to invite you to do in front of you somewhere is a yellow card now this is the invitation this morning that yellow card i want you to take that yellow card and there's two blank lines on the back of it at the bottom you can generally write prayer concerns on them, but here's what I want you to do today. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, I want you to take a few moments and pray. I'm going to ask Kathleen to come up and play. 
And as she does that, I'm going to ask you to take a few moments to pray and ask God, who is it that he's calling you to share your faith in Jesus Christ with over this next month? Maybe it's, maybe it's a member of your family. Maybe it's somebody you work with at your workplace. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's just someone you run into from time to time. But pray about who it is that God's calling you to sow the seed of the Word of God in their life. Just take a moment, and we're going to do that. And Kathleen, if you want to go ahead and pray, I'm going to I'm, play, I'm going to pray. So get your yellow card ready. If you have a pen, use If you don't, we'll give you a pen at the end of the service. So just join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, as we come to the conclusion of this service, you call us to sow the seed. You call us to sow the, your word. Sow the good news of your son Jesus. Sow it with confidence and with patient faith. Lord God, move your spirit in our lives in such a way that right now in these moments of invitation, this is how we're going to respond. Help us to write the name down of the person you want us to sow seed in their lives. Bring that name to us, Lord. Maybe it's, maybe it's not one name, maybe it's a family. But bring that one name or that one family to our minds right now. And Lord God, as that come to mind, help us to write it down as an act of commitment. And then help us, Lord, to know what you want us to do. It may be to start a conversation. It may be, Lord, just to build a relationship that leads to a conversation. It may be simply to invite him to church. Invite him to worship. Where together as the church we can be in prayer for them and sharing with them. Show us what you want us to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And this is how we're going to end the service. I would be remiss if I didn't say, if someone here today wants to know what it means to follow Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, I want you to stay after service. Stay after service, and I'll, I'm going to be at this door shaking hands. Just wait for me. I'll wait for you. You wait for me. And we'll talk and pray together about what that means. But what I'm going to ask for the rest of you, I'm going to ask you to physically write down that name or whatever on that yellow card and I want you to lay it right along through here lay it at the altar I want you to come up and lay it at the altar before you leave I'm going to ask once they're all here I'm going to come get them and I'm going to keep them and I will covenant with you I will pray for those names you don't have to write your name on the card if you don't want to write your name that's fine but write who you're praying for and, and working on and I'll tell you what I'll be praying with you this week and throughout this month and may this month be a great harvest for the kingdom of God in our midst. Now I'll be back at the door shaking hands. But this altar is open for you to come, lay that card down, and make that commitment. And I'm inviting you to do it. Is it a different type of invitation? Yeah. But God's been working on me. I may be old. I'm an old dog, but I can still learn new tricks. I realize how much it means, I think, to God and the kingdom for us to make this type of commitment periodically. So I'm inviting you to do it. And as you do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And let all God's people say, Amen.